Good afternoon. Welcome to another A Push video for Mr. with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. This is A Push review mode that we're in. Today we're looking at economic change and sectionalism, 1800 to 1860. So we want to keep in mind with the map over here, we've got three different regions. We've got the Northeast, we've got the West, or what we call it today more of the Midwest, and then we've got the South. And you know, it's it, this is constantly evolving. Uh, I stopped my map at about 1850. Post-1850, you're getting California. Kansas is going to come into the picture. Um, Oregon, eventually, before the Civil War comes in the picture, you've got a lot of different states constantly popping up. But this gives you kind of a good idea of the interregional nature uh, of the United States in the three sections of this time. And you hear a lot of different things on the AP test. You're going to talk about sectionalism. You're going to talk about worsening relations between North and South. So there's different ways that this could be phrased if you saw an essay question on the test. Let's go ahead and get started. One type of major question with sectionalism and the economic change in the antebellum period. Antebellum, of course, means 1800-1860, pre-Civil War South or pre-Civil War America. Um, how did the regions develop economically, that is? The Northeast, the Northeast is going to be doing what we would call developing the textile industry. And this is going to happen between, well, Samuel Slater in 1790 is going to be the dawn of it, but really it gets going in um, the period a little bit later on than that. It's going to be something with Francis Cabot, Lowell, it really takes off, and then other, other factory mechanics uh, that develop these factories, many of them escape from Great Britain, and you're going to have a textile industry. Lowell was the largest business at the time. But throughout kind of the Northeast area, industrialization really takes off, especially in New England. Okay? Now, as this is going on, what are they producing? It's textile industry. And the British had kind of been the main ones doing this beforehand, a little bit France. But America has a real opportunity here. And we'll see how this all plays together in a little bit. There, you know, by the time you get to the 1840s and 50s, you do have all kinds of different manufacturing. Eli Whitney's is a primitive assembly line and the idea of interchangeable parts are going to come into play and you start seeing the mass manufacturing of uh, weapons and things like that. But at this point when we're talking the early 1800s we're really talking about textile production early on. Okay, But what you're going to see is the dramatic influx of immigrants into the Northeast. Cities grow from towns into these massive cities. They have industry basis and uh, the, this becomes just kind of an industrial powerhouse very quickly after the 1820s when they've kind of gotten uh, developed enough to survive. The South, Eli Whitney's cotton gin is going to revolutionize the South and really by the time we get to 1800 the, the cotton gin starts to make cotton more profitable. The cotton gin is going to um, mean you need less uh, labor to get the cotton seeds picked out because it's going to pluck them out. But at the same time, the more cotton land you have, the more money you can make. So cotton becomes, cotton producers become extremely rich. And the more land they can get, the better. And one of the side effects of this for the South is they will plant as much, they don't understand crop rotation, they're going to plant as much cotton as they can, as quickly as they can. And when they do this, this is going to, unfortunately for them, it's going to result in soil exhaustion, all the nutrients being depleted. So they'll have a consistent push to get more and more land to the west as we go through this time period of 1800 to 1860. Okay, so that's the northeast and the south. The west, by the time you get to the 1820s and beyond, you really do start to see people filling in more and you start to see states actually enough population to become states and state development and you're going to have some major cities and then tons of farmland. And the climate of the farmland is going to be very beneficial for growing grains. And so you come to see the south becomes cotton dominated with some tobacco and a little bit of rice. You're going to see the northeast is going to be industrial based and the midwest is going to be uh, kind of the breadbasket of the country. Now some people are going to look at this and say, hey, this is a great idea. We can make this all work together. And you're going to see this as a, an idea. That's to pick, uh, it appears in 1816 from uh, Henry Clay, one of the most influential guys in the 1800s not to become the president. And he comes up with this idea of the American system. And the American system says you'd have interregional trade. So you would have trade going back and forth between the west and the north, the northeast and the south, the west and, and the south. 
And the idea is with everybody producing different things, instead of having to buy things from other countries, you could be almost self-sufficient and each would have markets for its goods. Now we clearly see this with the need to get grains to every part of the country and we clearly see this with the Northeast and the South. You've got the cotton production here and the textiles, that is the manufacturing of clothing up here. You can see how they have kind of a symbiotic relationship there. These things all are kind of how the development happens of these different regions. So what happens with this? How did this cause sectionalism is the second question. Uh, well, so you've got the impact of early industrialization. And the, one of the things that comes with early industrialization is tariff. So the Northeast, to get these industries going, the British are trying to like lower the prices and drive them out of business. They start asking for tariffs. Well, they get them and initially they do protect them well, but then they're going to keep ratcheting the tariffs higher and higher. Who loses? It's domestic consumers, other people in the United States, to a limited extent, the population in the West, but certainly in the South, where they're having to buy everything in exchange for cotton, it makes life more expensive for them. The higher the tariff is, the more they lose. The Northeast doesn't care because this is their prosperity is based on having this tariff. So the impact of early industrialization is, yeah, the North and South, our, our Northeast and South are kind of dependent upon each other, but the tariff causes massive friction, as we'll see. Importance of slavery to the South. So the, the tariff and just immigrants and industrialization is very important to the Northeast. The South, the more slaves they can get and the more land they can get, the more profitable they can become. And this is going to transition in the early, from the early 1800s, just kind of greed and desire to get as much as you can, to this defensiveness as abolitionism starts to pop up, of course, in the North. And people start to say, maybe slavery is not good. They get very defensive and protective of it and start having all kinds of political machinations to maintain and protect slavery's existence. Um, so the importance of slavery to the South, they will defend at all costs because the entire South's economy becomes based on it. And here's another thing. From the very beginning of colonization, the Northeast had been very uh, diversified in their economy. But the South, all agricultural, not much infrastructure, not many schools, not many roads. They're going to have far less railroads. In fact, most of the railroads are not going to go west-south. They're just going to go... They're going to go a little bit north-south, but a lot of times they would just ship down to the few ports, which were mainly seaports and cities, uh, and then they would have east-west railroads. So you see more of a partnership between the west and the north. Manifest destiny and response. Manifest destiny, you have a southern president, James Polk, and he is going to end up, he has a chance to get more land up here, get more land down here. He's going to elect to compromise up here and get everything he can down here. Why? It comes back to more land for slavery, the protection of slavery, uh, expansion of cotton, all of these things. So, the, of course, the North is going to be very angry, and this sets you hurtling towards the uh, Civil War because the North and the West feel cheated in Manifest Destiny, the way that Polk uh, takes things, uh, the direction he takes things. The South gets more and more defensive and protective of what they consider their livelihood and essential to their survival. Examples of sectional conflict. Missouri Compromise. So why does this happen? Missouri right here, Missouri was ready to become a state and the South said, well wait a minute, this, this is going to be a, a slave state. The North said, no it won't. To maintain a sectional balance in the Senate, we'll see this again with, in a minute, the sectional balance in the Senate, you get Maine as a free state, Missouri as a slave state, and then they carve out the Missouri Compromise line, 3630 coming down here, and this is for the Louisiana Purchase Territory. So it looks like this Missouri Compromise settles things. Tariff of abominations. Going back to another issue we've already discussed, the tariff, uh, the North jacks the tariff up very, uh, extremely high, and the South is going to feel like this is really terrible. South Carolina threatens to nullify it. Um, there's like even a little bit of talk of secession, and eventually this is going to get quelled. Henry Clay um, is going to be at the center of all of these compromises. Henry Clay is also at the center of the American system, which won't get passed until he's dead. Really, it comes into play after the Republicans take control during the Civil War. Uh, the, the tariff abominations get solved with the Compromise Tariff, which gradually lowers it down. The Compromise of 1850, uh, this is going to be when California is ready to become a state, and now it would off offset that sectional balance. Texas is even, even delayed for nine years due to the fear of offsetting this balance in the Senate between northern and southern states. So the northern and southern state relationship greatly impacted by how many states you have, and the, the South's like undying protection of slavery. Eventually California comes in in return for popular sovereignty and a tougher fugitive slave law and a few other minor concessions. 
But of course, that leads to all kinds of new problems. And that's all the time we have for today, kind of looking at how economic change leads to sectionalism in different regions. Stay classy, Sam Brown.